This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Well, we're going to continue in our home series today, and we're talking about building stronger families. And the title of my message this morning, for those of you who are taking notes, is called Revolve. And as I was preparing this message, I began to think about the science fair. I don't know if you remember science fair at all, or if you participate in science fair. There were always a few projects that you could count on happening at science fair when you're in school. You just knew some kid, whether you were that kid or not, you knew some kid was going to bring a few key items to the science fair. There was going to be the volcano, right? You, you know there's going to be the volcano show up at the science fair. Um, you know that somebody's going to uh, do the uh, solar system. And if they were the kid that actually spent the time to paper mache a solar system or actually go and buy the little styrofoam balls from like a Hobby Lobby or something and paint them or try to make them like the solar system, put them on the sticks, that was a lot of effort. But then there are those cheater kids. And maybe I'm calling you out today. Maybe you were a cheater kid that actually went and bought one of those solar systems. And the really cool kids bought the solar systems that moved. They were on like a little track or something. And you're like, what? And this kid's like, I got this. Yeah, what you got is mommy took you to the store and spent a ridiculous amount of money for you to get a ribbon. That's what you got. Anyways, I'm not bitter, but... (laughs) Some of those solar systems, they actually, actually moved, and you would see those things rotate. But out of all of the things that would rotate and revolve and orbit, there was one thing on that solar system diagram that you would see at the school fair, at the science fair, that didn't move, and that was the sun. Everything else was moving around that sun. Everything was going around it. And last week, I said that we know too much and we apply too little And my hope for you last week was that you identified one goal that you are consistently growing in to develop a stronger family. And I want to encourage you today to keep going and not to give up. But today's message is going to help you with application because we all know that our lives should revolve around God. We all understand that aspect. Matter of fact, you could probably preach a message about putting God first just as well, if not better than me, because we've been so schooled and trained for the fact that we're supposed to put God first. But again, we know too much and we apply too little. So my goal for you today is that we would walk away understanding with clear steps and clear direction how God would have us actually apply to be growing consistently His truth and His Word so our lives can truly revolve around Him. So let's talk about taking that theory and that idea and let's talk about putting it into practice so we can grow stronger as families. And I want to lead off with this question. What are your non-negotiables? What are your non-negotiables in life? That's where you have to start when you're looking to identify what does my life truly revolve around. I didn't ask what is the correct answer to pastor's question, because if you've been in church longer than five minutes, you probably know the right answer to the question. I'm talking about what does your life really revolve around. So if you have your Bible, go to Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at Jesus' teaching here in Luke 12. We're going to start looking around verse 29. Luke chapter 12 and verse 29. And don't forget, while you're turning there, if you don't have your Bible today, don't feel weird about it. We have Bibles in the back there at the auditorium. They're the same translation as what I have, which is the English Standard Version. You can just go borrow one of those and put it back when you're done. Or if you don't have a Bible, consider that our gift to you. Otherwise, you can use your smartphone and get on new version and just sync up with the uh, live portion because you can actually follow along in the notes that I've written and provided there for you in the live version of uh, that program or that app that you may have. Luke chapter 12 and verse 29, Jesus said this. He said, Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all of the nations seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and all of these things are going to be added to you. Fear not, little flock, 
for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I asked you the question, what are your non-negotiables? And here Jesus himself is letting us know what's most important, where we're supposed to put our time, where we're supposed to put our energy. He said, listen, don't store up for yourselves treasures on this earth because that stuff's going to rot. That stuff's going to fade away. It doesn't matter how impressive it is to other people. It doesn't matter what other people may think about that particular thing that you bought or that particular thing that you own or how well someone speaks of you in this particular scenario. He said, don't focus on those things. He said, instead, store up your treasures in heaven because where your treasures are, that's where your heart is going to also be. So your heart orders your priorities. Your heart is the one that truly dictates where your time goes, what your world truly revolves around. Too many times we try to put God in a position where he revolves around our lives. We try to figure out where he fits. Where does God fit? Where are we going to involve God? Because our lives are going to be revolving around whatever's in our heart. And if our heart is truly not centered on God, and if he's not in the center of that solar system, then we're saying, God, you need to be orbiting me to where you conveniently pass by when I need you. And I'll get from you what I need when you conveniently revolve around my life and you fit. When it makes sense for you to be involved in my life, that's when I'm going to involve God. Oh, it doesn't work out this week, or it doesn't work out this Sunday, or it doesn't work out this Tuesday, or it doesn't work out this time. But maybe I can squeeze you in. I've got a slot here on my day timer. Who uses day timers anymore? A few of you? Okay. I got a slot here on my day timer or my fancy app that's going to organize my world that I had to absolutely have. And all of a sudden, I'm looking for a spot for God because he's supposed to somehow accommodate me. He's supposed to somehow revolve around my life. But here's the problem, is that things in your family that are non-negotiable, they show where your heart's at. It's like a litmus test. Let me just say it better. The things you don't make excuses for are your priorities, okay? The things you don't make excuses for are your priorities. The things we say are important to us, but we always make excuses for, those things really aren't in our heart like they should be. Otherwise, our lives would be ordered around those things. No one has ever said, I think no one has ever said, if, it, if I wasn't forced to binge watch Netflix all day, I would have paid those bill or, bills or played with my kids. But I was forced to binge watch Netflix today. Oh, if it wasn't for that binge watching of Netflix, I would have done it. But I was forced to. Proverbs 4 and 23 says to guard our heart above all else. Because out of our heart flows the issues of life. So in other words, our heart is going to order and direct all of the things that we do. It's going to actually touch everything else in our lives. And too many times we look for secrets and we look for quick fixes to fix everything on the outside because there's an area that we don't like that we're trying to fix. But God says, no, it actually all flows from the heart. And you need to allow God to truly become the center of your world so you can revolve around him instead of asking him to revolve around you because your heart's going to direct your desires. Your heart's going to direct what you really want to do. And then what you really want to do, your desires are going to direct your decisions. You're going to make decisions based off of your desires. And then the decisions you make are going to determine your direction. They're going to determine where you're going in life, what you're doing. It's going to set out that path for you. But it doesn't start with trying to figure out the path. So many people are so interested in figuring out the path. What does God want me to do? I, wanna, I want direction. I, wanna, I want him to show me his great plan. Well, he's actually wanting you to humble yourself and to actually open up your heart to him and allow him to become your desire. And then as he is your desire, you'll see the decisions you need to make that are going to unveil to you and show you your direction, not the other way around. Too many times we want to work backwards with God. That's why God says, put me first, and then I'll fix everything else. I'll actually touch everything else, and you won't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He said, don't freak out about those things. That's what he was just saying here in Luke chapter 12. 
Don't store up for yourself treasures here on this earth. Don't put your time, effort, and energy into just trying to amass and accumulate so many things for yourself because you need to actually allow your life to be revolving around God. And then where your heart is, you're going to begin to make those right decisions. You're going to begin to see the right direction and the right path that you're supposed to take. So many people just want the direction because they want God to revolve around their world. Oh, God, just show me what to do. And then once you feel like God has shown you what to do, or you have gotten enough people to justify what you want to do, and you've actually called it God, but it's really just justification of something you knew you didn't need to do because you got enough people on your bandwagon and on your team to tell you and convince you that what you want to do really is God telling you to do it. Then all of a sudden you justify that, and then you go down that path and you do what you feel like you want to do, then you're done with God. Then we tell God, oh, you can sit in the back seat until I need to talk to you again. God, I'm going to exclude you from life until I need you again. Then all of a sudden another situation comes up. God, I need direction. I need direction. And we go to him for direction. You see, direction from God should be the natural flow of a believer whose life and heart is set on him. It should be something that flows out of me naturally, something that actually I'm walking in. That's why the Bible says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. It's that we're seeking his heart, and he has become the center of our world, and everything revolves around him. Therefore, whatever my world revolves around, the very core, the very center touches and affects change in all of those decisions and the direction. So if you don't like the direction your family or your marriage or your kids are headed, then you need to change your non-negotiables. You need to change what are the non-negotiables, the things you don't make excuses for, the things that you quit excusing away. Too many times we call the God factor in our life the very thing or the very relationship that we often excuse away because we're busy, because we're tired, because we just don't know if this is going to work or not. And we just have all of this long laundry list of excuses. But a non-negotiable is something that we don't make excuses for. It's something that is just understood. So if you really want to build a strong home, your home needs to revolve around the non-negotiable of God being at the center. It needs to be non-negotiable. It's like we're going to do these things. You remember last week I talked about consistency is the key. And I shared with you how it's not just doing things one time that's going to cause change, but that it's doing the right things consistently that are actually going to bring about change in our lives. Man, when our world revolves around God, when he is at the very center, and we say this is a non-negotiable, and we make God being at the center of our lives a non-negotiable, and we're consistent with that, it touches everything. It touches everything that we do. And it changes everything. It changes our desire, it changes our decisions, and it changes our direction. Because what your life revolves around literally touches every part of your life. That's why Proverbs 4 and 23 that we just mentioned earlier says that guard the heart above all else because out of your heart flows the issues of life. Out of the heart flows the issues of life. But the problem is, is that you and I have rebelled against God. We have rejected God. We have run from God. In our sin, we have turned from God. And so therefore, we can't trust our own heart because our heart is not pure. That's why we have to have God because God is the only one who can make us pure. God is the only one who is pure. And because God is pure, he's worthy to be trusted and worthy to be at the center of my life. Amen? Something that's not pure should not be at the center of my life. That's why God is pure And we need him at the center of our lives because if he's at the center, then to the pure, all things are pure. He's going to begin to touch everything. That's what Titus 1 and 15 says. It says to the pure, all things are pure. It says that we need to understand the purity of God and the holiness of God because as he's at the center of our world, the purity of God begins to touch every area of my life. And then I begin to make decisions that are pure. I began to head in a direction that is pure. I began to have pure desires. I didn't say perfect desires. I didn't say perfect direction. I didn't say perfect decisions. But they began to be a lot more in tune and in step with God when I center my world around Him and I make Him the non-negotiable because only the gospel of Jesus Christ can make our hearts pure. Amen? It turns my heart towards God. And because the gospel turns my heart towards God, it actually causes my heart's desires to be turned towards his desire or his will. We pray that, God, your your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
and we say that prayer because we've memorized that prayer, but have we ever thought truly about His will, His desire being in sync with our desire? That's only going to happen one way. That's only going to happen with Him at the center where our lives revolve around Him and we are not asking Him to revolve around us. We are not the center of the world. Amen, somebody. You see, here's the thing. If you put your faith in Christ, then you need to trust Him by reorienting the things in your life that are non-negotiable. So what that means is that it no longer matters what you think is important, but rather what has God said is important that He's put in place, that He said is pure, that our family is going to make non-negotiable. Those things, the pure things, will cause your family to grow and change because now your life is revolving around God at the very center. And we just have to make these things non-negotiable. I am a part of the false clergy, and the false clergy has a monthly meeting on the first Thursday of every month. <clears throat> and I have, you know, made some, missed some, and then I go through seasons where I miss a lot, and then I'll feel bad about it, and I'll try to make it up. And when you go to these meetings with all these different pastors, ministers, priests, and it's, it's everybody, you know, that wants to come anyways, which normally ends up being a very small group. <clears throat> the group's not very motivated to get together. It's kind of awkward sometimes when you get together. Um, it's just weird getting together with other, other ministers and, and, and pastors because these guys are, some of these guys have been wounded. Some of these guys have trust issues. Um, some of these guys overshare um, <laughs> some, some of, some of, some of these guys, you know, they, uh, they, they, they just, maybe there, there's something there where because of their beliefs, they don't want to fellowship. I don't know what their issues are, but, but it's weird. Okay. When you get together with these guys and you try to find common ground and you want to be an encouragement to them because, you know, if we're preaching that Jesus is the only way, um, then we may have some little things here and there that vary. But if we're preaching that Jesus is the only way, then we're on the same team. And for us to see ourselves as that sometimes is challenging. And so those guys really get discouraged getting together. And the guy that kind of heads it up is Pastor Brad Vienendahl over at the First Reformed Church. And I love Pastor Brad. He's a super cool guy. He's very real, very authentic. And he's taken the responsibility to organize these events um, every month. <clears throat> and I just kind of caught myself in a funk of not going. And um, as I caught myself kind of not going, um, Pastor Brad asked me if I would be willing to coordinate the events for the rest of the year. <laughs> because he wasn't going to be able to make any of them. <laughs> and I said, sure. But here was the problem. The problem with my attendance with the false clergy, my consistency with it, was that I hadn't made it a non-negotiable. It was something that if my schedule allowed, that I would fit it in. Because when it would come around, which it was never a shocker when it was coming around, I knew it was the first Thursday of every month. And I knew what time I had not made that a priority. So therefore, oftentimes because of the busyness of being a pastor of a church, something happens and, you know, I've got a valid excuse why I can't go. And you're almost kind of like, yay, you know, <laughs> You're almost like, oh, something came up. I'm sorry I won't be able to be there. But now I'm responsible for coordinating them. And so I got really convicted about this because I want to support not just Word of Grace, but I want to support other churches in our community. And I want to support other people like Pastor Brad because I love him. He's a friend of mine, and I really like the guy, and we connect really well. And I want to invest more in those relationships. But for that to happen... <laughs> It's got to change from more than me just knowing I should go, and now I have to go because I'm coordinating them. So now I have decided instead of putting <clears throat> those events in my calendar when they fit, I've decided to go ahead and put all of those events in my calendar, and then when something comes up, I just have to plan around that event because I'm making it a non-negotiable now. I'm putting that thing in stone, and I'm saying, if something comes up on a Thursday, it has to be a dire emergency for me to cancel this meeting because this now has become a priority to me because these relationships are important. I see the value in it, and now I'm responsible, so I need to make sure that I'm doing my part too. So I went ahead and had 
uh, Peter, our office manager, not just put the ones that I'm responsible for the rest of this year, but I had him put all the ones for next year on my calendar and say it. And I told him, I said, Peter, these dates when people want to schedule meetings are non-negotiable because I'm making this thing a priority. And then as I saw myself getting more involved, I actually began to ask Pastor Brad, how could I help more? So I became the unofficial official secretary of our group where I actually take notes and I send follow-up emails and I stay in contact with all the pastors. So now my role has deepened because now I'm committed. Now I'm invested. Now I've made it a non-negotiable. And actually I find myself enjoying the meetings more than I ever did. And actually now we have some creative ideas that have been stirred up. And I'm actually excited about the future of where this group could possibly go. As to where before, it wasn't a big deal. You see, you've got to make things non-negotiable. You've got to decide what is going to be important to our family. What's going to be at the center of our lives? What are the things that we're not going to make excuses for? What are the things that we're going to build around instead of hope that they happen as we're just going about the rhythm of life? What are the things that we're intentionally investing in to see those things instilled in our children or in our marriage? What are the things that we're intentionally doing to invest in our relationship with God? What are the things that are not negotiable? We are doing this. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how stressed we are. It doesn't matter what so-and-so wants to do in our lives. These things are non-negotiable. Those things, the pure things, will cause your family to grow and change because your life will revolve around God and what He wants you to live and what He wants you to do. You see, when we properly place our priorities... It predicts our purpose. So properly placed priorities predict purpose. Say that five times fast. Is that hard to say? It's even harder to do. It's even harder to do. Do you want to have greater purpose as a family? Do you want your purpose to grow? Do you want to be a stronger family? Do you want to have a stronger home? Then you've got to get your priorities in line. You've got to get your non-negotiables in line. And it's going to be hard at some times because if your priorities have been out of whack, then when you put those non-negotiables in your family, shoo, man, sometimes it can cause a lot of tension. But you've got to know that those are the right things, the pure things, and you've got to know that they're worth it. I, I ask people this, I say, what, what hill is worth dying on? What non-negotiable do I need to have in my life that I know is right, that I know is pure, that is storing up treasures in heaven? the things that are investing in my life and the right things. You see, when you place the non-negotiables that God wants in your life and build your life around those things, then you just say no to those other things that want to come and distract. There may be a great opportunity on a Thursday morning for me to go to some really inspiring or encouraging event or for me to go meet with someone that I really enjoy and we really have a good time. But you know what? I'm going to have to say no because I'm committing to the non-negotiable. And I'm saying this has value, this has importance, and I'm going to let my life and my schedule actually flow and revolve around that instead of the opposite, because it matters. Spending time with your spouse matters, amen? <clears throat> Date night is a great concept, and it's a cute thing that we throw around, but do we actually make it a non-negotiable? Spending time with our children sounds cute, and we feel bad when we're not doing it. And when we hear things like that in a sermon on a Sunday morning... We kind of go, oh. But if it's a non-negotiable, then we push through the tiredness, the busyness, because those other things are going to still be there. But is this a non-negotiable? Connecting with God and starting your day off with Him, is that a non-negotiable to you? If, if it is, then it doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter how the night before went. It's a non-negotiable. It's funny the things in life that we make non-negotiables. And think about that. Think about the things that you do not make excuses for. <clears throat> think about the recent... Th th think about the things that you don't have to excuse away. That's going to be the litmus test here, non-negotiables. Man, I, I'm going to say this, and I don't... It's going to be hard, okay? I'm about to say something really difficult for some of you to hear, but I don't mean this in, in a mean or judgmental way, but it's still true. Man, the reason that our kids 
sports schedules conflict with the church is because Christians didn't make the church non-negotiable. You see, if they had, the schools would have changed, but instead we changed. You see, if our families revolved around God and prayer, then God and prayer becomes non-negotiable. Getting into the Word becomes non-negotiable. And then the things around us are going to have to flow with that instead of us having to change and make a bunch of excuses. You see, we need to get to the place in life, church, where we refuse to make excuses, we re- where we refuse to say, you know what, it's not, it, 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 it's, I'm too busy, or I've got too much on my plate. We need to get to a place where we stop making excuses for not connecting with other people at church or in faithfulness and weekend worship or serving others or helping our church family move forward, or getting to know others through engaging in community groups, or things like that. There's all sorts of things that are life-giving that God wants you to connect with, whether it's here at our church, or whether it's in your quiet time personally, or whatever it is. But when those things begin to be presented to you, and you know these things are pure, and you know these things are going to be positive influences in your life, and you know that these things are going to be setting God at the center for our lives to revolve around, then they become non-negotiable. You see, these things become non-negotiable because my family is worth it, because my home is worth it, and I'm not going to make excuses anymore because my family is going to revolve around God and not try to make God revolve around my family when it's convenient to include Him. Praying at the dinner table should be non-negotiable. Spending time with the Lord should be non-negotiable. What your family revolves around impacts and influences and affects everything. And if we want stronger homes, if we want stronger families, if we want stronger marriages, we have to revolve around what is pure. And we have to make revolving around what is pure and what is right, not negotiable. The best leading indicator of your success in life as a Christian on this journey is what does your life revolve around? What does your family revolve around? The non-negotiables are the things that you're willing to be inconvenienced for. The non-negotiables are the things that you're willing to sacrifice for. Those are the non-negotiables. Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that show us what we're revolving around. I want to read us one more scripture today in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. Not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16, closer to the back of your Bible. 1 John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, that He, Jesus, laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for others. What was non-negotiable for Jesus? That we love one another and that we follow His example. That we're willing to lay down our lives and sacrifice for one another. That we care for one another that we make those things non-negotiable, that serving each other is not negotiable, that loving each other is not negotiable, that walking in freedom and forgiveness is not negotiable. (coughs) Folks, we've got to stop arguing with God. We have got to stop wrestling these same issues over and over again with God that He keeps showing us that we keep debating with him over. God is saying, I'm the rock. I don't move. I'm not changing my position. If I've said this, this is where I stand on it. Now, where are you at? Are you going to put your life and your trust and your hope on the solid rock? Are you going to let him be the center that affects everything else? Is he going to be at the core Is he going to be in the middle or or is he going to be conveniently placed? God says, I'm not debating. I'm not arguing. 
I'm saying this is my word. It's true. Whether or not you believe it is up to you, but it's still true regardless of whether you choose to believe it or not. And he's still faithful whether you choose to trust that he is or not. And he's still going to do what he said he's going to do whether you want to do things his way or your way. But if I trust him, if I submit to him, if I say this is no longer negotiable, I am tired of wrestling with God. I'm tired of fighting with God. And you submit to that. And watch what he does in your life. Watch what he does in your marriage. Watch what he does with your children. Even on a practical level. As you begin to make things in your home non-negotiable. And you begin to be consistent in those areas that are pure, that are right, that you know are right. I opened up the message last week by asking you, what makes a strong home? Write down three things that makes a strong home, makes a strong family. And I said, I can probably predict what everybody's writing down. They're probably writing down God. Spending time together. Having fun. Quality time. Not just quantity, quality. And you write those things down because you know what it takes to make a strong family. The problem is, is that you get discouraged when you meet opposition problem is is that you get weary when you're trying to establish a new non-negotiable in your home and you want to throw up your hands and go it's not working out for me but i'm here to encourage you to stay the course keep investing in the things that you know are right keep making those things non-negotiable maybe today someone was on the brink and on the edge of giving up on their marriage or giving up in a situation with their kids or giving up with a situation at school or at work. But today, God wanted you to hear that you need to be close to Him and draw close to Him. And that He is still the truth. He is still the life. He is still the way. That He's not changing. That He's saying, will you go my way or are you going to do it your way? That He's saying... Are you going to make me the priority or are you going to make me the convenience that gets fit in where you see and deem necessary? We need to stop going to God just when we're in crisis mode. We need to have Him at the center of our lives whether we're up on top of the mountain or whether it seems like we're sucking for air in the bottom of the valley. Amen, somebody? Because He's the rock. He's the firm foundation. And we need to make him non-negotiable. Lord, I thank you for this message today. I pray you help us to take this word and this challenge of being consistent, Lord, in the non-negotiables that you show us, Father, today. Those things in our life that we have made non-negotiable that we didn't really realize had actually become non-negotiable that are actually not healthy for us. And they're misprioritized. We want to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, God, where they don't get corroded or corrupted, even if we don't see the immediate results. And even if we've kind of blown it in some areas and we feel like, oh, I wish I would have heard this so many years ago or before I got married or I wish I would have known this before the kids moved out of the house or, oh, I wish I would have known this before this. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that people that are thinking that stuff, that you quiet their minds and you let them know it's not over that you let them know it's not too late to start making the right things, the pure things, not negotiable. I pray you let them know right now, Father, that you encourage them to take a step in the right direction and to stop making excuses. I thank you for that, Lord, that you strengthen our resolve, that you strengthen, Lord, that word in us, and that you solidify that in every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.